You're listening to the Churchosity Podcast, where we talk about the quality of being the church. Welcome to another episode of the Churchosity Podcast. I am your host, The Theological Coordinator. This is the show where we talk about the hard stuff, the tough stuff. We ask the questions that maybe a lot of Christians are afraid to ask or sometimes even afraid to answer. But as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. We are in the middle of our series called You Are Not Alone, discussing spiritual abuse. Everybody give a thunderous applause to my amazing wife, Andrea Brady, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Oh, you betcha. You know I love having you here. Thank you. I love looking to my right and seeing your beautiful face (laughs) and hearing your voice. It's awesome. Thank you. So as we continue in this series, just as a refresher, sweetheart, uh, let's remind the audience of what we mean when we are talking about spiritual abuse. Well, we're talking about people in the church hurting each other. Correct. Yeah. Using some of their theological views, uh, their doctrinal stances, their spiritual beliefs, their position of influence, their position of power, Mm -hmm. or at least the position that they think or perceive that they have right as a means to hurt someone else in the faith whether intentional or not yeah and that's the tough part sometimes i think you know when when you're not aware of the fact that you have kind of gone above and beyond offending someone you've kind of perpetually been hurting someone and you're not intentionally doing it you're not aware that you're doing it mm-hmm. And, and then that person comes to you and says, hey, I got this thing and uh, we need to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, it creates kind of a very interesting moment of intense fellowship, I would say. <laughs> well, hopefully it's well received. <laughs> right. And when we talk about how the church should handle spiritual abuse, that is going to be one very important point in that conversation. For the purpose of this episode, we're still focusing on divulging or unpacking the different types of what we think are spiritual abuse. Yeah. Because essentially when someone is spiritually abusing another person, that person who is abusing is frankly more concerned about pushing their own agenda or their own ideology Mm -hmm. onto that person or even hiding their own faults. Right. And all of that at the cost of their relationship with the victim. Mm-hmm. I know I've used this verse before, but it, it's it's such a powerful, promising verse from the Lord. It's found in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, where God says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Mm -hmm. And this verse is just a constant reminder that in God alone, there is hope and there is healing. And I know that when we talk about spiritual abuse, there's not a lot of people talking about it. And because there's not a lot of people who talk about this subject, there's not a lot of ways to know how to heal from it. Part of that healing process is knowing that you are of value Mm -hmm. to God knowing that your value is in God. We call it having the eternal perspective. Right. That remembering God is on his throne, and if you are a Christian, you are his child, and he knows what you're going through, and he knows the hurt that you have, and he will provide the healing. And I think a lot of times, when we are victims of spiritual abuse, we feel like we are alone. Yeah. We feel like we're on an island all by herself and nobody gets it and nobody sees and nobody cares. Right. I think that if sometimes when we've addressed the issue, 
um, it's expected of the victim to heal immediately. Right, get you, over it. And if you have not gotten over it, there's you're in sin. There's or, something wrong with you. Yeah, you don't right. have enough faith. You haven't given it to the Lord, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Whatever. Why are you bringing up old stuff? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. But it, it's, it's impor- not that easy. Right, it's not. But it's important to somehow remember the value that you are to God. Mm-hmm. In spite of not being part of the in crowd at church (laughs) in spite of being used for your gifts for your talents and maybe even for your money like an asset like an asset correct Mm. or even in spite of the way that you may have been neglected by others in the church Mm -hmm. psalm chapter 34 verse 18 says that the lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit Psalm 147 verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Two very, very amazing verses promising that the Lord is near to those of us who have had our hearts broken by others. Yeah, those are really good. That he saves and preserves those who have had their spirit crushed Mm -hmm. by others. And that he heals our broken hearts and he binds up our wounds. So if you haven't noticed from the conversation already, the theme of this episode, we're going to talk about various divisions inside the church body. Things that happen behind closed doors, so Mm. to speak, metaphorically speaking. The first way that there is division behind closed doors is the sin of partiality. Mm. Okay. It's when a person is labeled as having some sort of issue and they only get treated nicely when nobody's around. Oh. Hmm. But in the church, we are called to love each other, to help each other, to support each other, to disciple each other, to come alongside of each other. And yet, partiality is kind of a popular area of spiritual abuse in the church. And I think this might even be one of those areas that people unintentionally are abusing each other. Yeah. It's scary if it's done on purpose, though. Mm -hmm. And I can think of one very classic example of intentional partiality in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And you find it in the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Okay. Where Paul confronts Peter specifically because of the sin of partiality. Peter was guilty of being kind to the Gentiles when nobody else was around. Okay. And so why this was important is because Paul was called to preach the gospel and plant churches to the Gentile nations and communities. Peter was preaching the gospel to the Jewish communities. Mm. So when the Jewish people were not around, Peter was all kind and loving and and sitting down at a meal and sharing sharing dinner with the Gentiles. But as soon as even one other Jewish person came into the room, mm-hmm. he was shunning the Gentiles. Oh, and Paul got mad. Paul got he? up in his grill. <laughs> like you read that, but he says, I got in his face. I confronted, I confronted Peter to his face for what he was doing, right? And then you find in that passage in Galatians chapter 2 that the other Jews were following Peter's example. They were doing the same exact thing. So Mm. the partiality was multiplying. Well, this has pretty much existed in every church I've gone to. Yeah, I would have to agree, sadly. Yeah. I I would absolutely agree. Partiality specifically is dealing with, you know, acting positively towards someone when nobody else is around, but when other people are around, they're shunned. Mm -hmm. But the opposite side of the same coin is a very, very prominent form of spiritual abuse and that is preferential treatment and this is when a person is actually treated well because they're an asset or they bring something to the table Oh! but behind closed doors that person is disrespected right or they're only valuable as long as they're bringing something to the table yeah you're exactly right well I know that we have a friend who was an extraordinary singer 
Yes. And they were viewed as an asset in their church. Right. And the minute that they decided, well, you know, I need to take some time to myself. I don't feel like singing on the worship team right now. Then they were treated very poorly. People were angry with them for taking time to themselves. The same thing happened to me at a previous church. Oh, really? Remember. When I was on the worship team at a previous church. Oh, yes. And life was absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. And like I could not, I was not home enough. Yeah. I had to push something off of my plate. Mm -hmm. And remember, I went to the worship leader and said, I need to take a break. Right. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's totally fine. You just let me know whenever you want to come back. If you want to, if you want to serve less frequently, it's totally fine. But all I got was attitude after that. Yeah. That's an example of someone using you as an asset yep. and pushing their own agenda. I read a tweet recently that said, you know where the priorities are in your church by who your church is willing to let leave. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That might go over some people's heads, but uh, just chew on that for a well, while. Well, so it kind of seems to me that partiality and preferential treatment are like two sides of the same coin. They are. Okay. So like on the one side of the coin, you treat people as an asset and you're nice to them because they bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the coin, how would you explain it? You're only nice to them when nobody is around because you don't want to be associated with them. Okay. Yeah. I actually have an example of partiality. Okay. Well, one of the churches that we went to long ago... There was a group of people that went to our church. They were awesome, and I loved hanging out mm -hmm. with them, and I was friends with them. They were good people. They were really great people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they did as a group in our church was they served. Um, the hospitality community. Yes. They would make pancake breakfasts, or they were in charge of any kind of potluck dinner, right. etc. So one day... The pastor's wife decided, I'm going to change things up. I want to be in charge of hospitality. And I'm going to create a hospitality committee. And on this hospitality committee, none of the people who were previously in charge of doing hospitality... Who were, were actually the already existing hospitality committee. Yes. None of them were even asked to be a part of it. Or for their input... Yeah, there was no conversation Basically, at all. they were so gifted in hospitality. Yes. That was their gift. Mm -hmm. And they were, it was wonderful. And I was so shocked when it was taken away from them. I feel like they were robbed. Yeah. And it really broke my heart. And it's actually one of the reasons why we ended up leaving that church. In the, because I was just mortified yeah. that our leadership would do such a thing well and eventually that entire group of people left they did before we did yeah i mean they must have been heartbroken oh yeah absolutely yeah just imagine that you go to a church that presumably is a healthy functioning church but there is this group of like 20 people that all they do is hospitality that means that anytime there's a gathering at church that isn't within the confines of the worship service itself, there is a fresh meal prepared for the entire church. Mm. Anytime there is a family in need where, you know, you would have people making meals for people yeah. and taking the, and these people just did that. Yeah. Right. The Christmas party every year. Yep. Fully catered by these people. Yeah. And nothing expected in return. I mean, by definition, that is, after all, what hospitality essentially is, mm -hmm. right? And then out of nowhere, mm -hmm. someone in a position of influence yeah. decides they're going to change and take all of that away from them. For no good reason. For no good reason at all. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That absolutely broke my heart. Well, you know, another example of spiritual abuse is what I like to call neglectful treatment. Oh, yes. And, and this is a category of spiritual abuse, and it has a handful of subcategories to kind of fully explain the category of neglectful treatment. So, for example, if you verbalize your feelings about the way that you're being treated, people push you to the side. They neglect to care for you. You know, they essentially would say, oh, well, you should just get over it because it's the Christian thing to do. Or maybe 
you actually report your abuse to someone mm -hmm. because it's not safe to go confront the abuser. Yes. Right? Depending on what type of spiritual abuse we're talking about here. Or you go and confront your abuser, actually. And either way, you are shunned. You are pushed off to the side. Your heart is not cared for. Your spirit is not rejuvenated. What do you do when you are in a situation in your church, when you, are, you have been spiritually abused, and let's say it's a situation where you, where you feel safe enough, where you feel confident enough to actually practice Matthew 18 and go and confront that person, and they don't repent, and it, and it works its way up the sequence of events, and it comes to the point where, okay, now it's time to go to church leadership and, and ask them to come alongside, and even then, you're neglected. Right. That's what we're talking about. Mm. There is a conversation that has needed to take place for quite some time. Uh, what am I talking about? Well, my gracious and wonderful wife has a story that she would like to tell. <laughs> a personal story yeah. from her own experience. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I am wrong. What? I don't want to speak for you at all. Okay. But, so correct me if I am wrong. We have said on these episodes already that you and I have suffered various forms of spiritual abuse in our lives. Right. We identify with virtually every area that we have been unpacking up to this point. Mm -hmm. It is my humble opinion that the story that you are going to tell mm -hmm. is an episode of spiritual abuse that is the worst that you've experienced. Yeah, I think so. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I want to give a little trigger warning here. Because as part of the conversation, there's going to be some themes that probably come up mm -hmm. that are going to trigger folks in the audience. So I just I want to be sensitive to that, but we're going to be real genuine and honest as well. So I want to give my wife the floor. I okay. want to give my wife the microphone. All right. <laughs> and just, honey, you share from your heart, talk your talk, and uh, let the audience know about your situation because I can guarantee that there is somebody listening right now Mm -hmm. that has been through same or similar circumstances as the conversation that you're about to have now. Okay. So the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Well, in um, one of the previous churches that we went to, we always loved to serve, you know. So uh, I really love serving in the children's ministry, and I decided that uh, I would do something with Sunday school. Anyhow, so every church should have some kind of a, um, what would you call it? Screening process? Screening process, yeah. Of background checks. Background checks, yeah. Yeah, and then they also have like a two-person rule or what have you, which means that you can't leave children alone in the presence of just one adult. There should yeah, always, it was a two-adult rule. There should always be a two, at least two adults there with every, with every child at all times. And I was a stickler for that. So one Sunday, I was in Sunday school, and I would got there early so that I could get things ready for the kids. People started dropping off their children, and there weren't two adults in the room with me. Mm -hmm. So I decided that, you know, we had to do something about that because I'm not going to be left alone with these kids. So, because um, it's policy. Part of the procedures were was if there, if my second adult was late, someone who was hosting in the children's wing would come in and act as the second adult because we've all been through the same screening process, correct? Everyone in children's ministry is quote vetted. Yes. By going through the training. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And the background check. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, the person hosting was a man and he came into the room with me and therefore there were some children wandering around uh, um, before Sunday school started. I would say at the time there were probably five or six, five kids there, something like that. And I had my back to the classroom because I was prepping snack or crafts, something along the lines of something that we would need ahead of time. And, uh, all of a sudden, I felt someone touch my rear end. Mm -hmm. Someone walked behind me and touched me. And it was that man who had come into the room to be my second 
adult. Mm -hmm. And it was so subtle. I thought, really? Did this really happen? Did he touch me on purpose? Or did he just accidentally bump me while he was walking by? And because, you know, he was from a good Christian family who was well-respected in the church, and, I mean, he was vetted. He's serving with his wife in this ministry. He's been at the church longer than we have. I just gave the benefit of the doubt. It was so subtle. I'm probably, you know, I tried to downplay it in my mind because, first of all, I didn't want there to be an issue. <laughs> I mean, who wants to cause a problem? I didn't want to cause a problem. And that's, you know, in my victim mentality thinking, okay, if I say something, I could be blowing something out of proportion. All he has to do is to deny it. Um, what am I right. going to do and, here? And that's the unfortunate thing about the spiritual abuse culture mm -hmm. is that the the actual victim of spiritual abuse ends up being twice victimized because yeah. not only are they the victim of the abuse, they're the victim of the guilt that they could potentially be causing a problem yeah. if they say something. Right. And yet the problem has already occurred. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, you know, do anything. Right. <laughs> so I'm sitting here thinking in my mind, okay. But this is that preferential treatment thing. Yeah. Because this is a person who is well liked and well respected in mm -hmm. our church community? Yeah, and who serves in ministry mm -hmm. faithfully with his wife and everyone that I mean, I'm under the impression that everything's honky dory with that family, right? And that I mean, they're well respected. They're good Christian people. They have several children. Yes, and um, they're well liked. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm just, you know, this was an accident. I'm just gonna let it go. So you just you don't say anything. No, I didn't say anything right. except my daughter was serving with me in in Sunday school. Oh, that's right. And she was a teenager, and I told her, hey, something happened, and I want you to stay away from this guy. Mm -hmm. Or at least, you know, keep an eye out. If he comes near you, just move away. Because I wasn't certain that it was an accident. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't going to say anything. Right. Right. And that should have been a red flag for me. If I'm that concerned about it, that I'm willing, I'm telling my daughter, you know, heads up, stay away from this guy because he might be shady. <laughs> 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 I should have just, but at the time when it happens, when it happens to you, you're, there's so many emotions. There's so many thoughts. There's so many risks involved, you know, with saying anything. So I stayed silent mm -hmm. and I just gave him the benefit of the doubt, you know, prayed to the Lord, gave it to Jesus, whatever you want to call it. And I mean, not to be flippant because I did pray to the Lord and I certainly was praying that it was an accident and I certainly was praying that he wasn't doing this to other people and Lord help him if he did it again to me because, <laughs> right. well, fast forward and he did. Um, right. He did. It happened again. It did happen again. So we were fellowshipping in the foyer, and it was quite busy. And I was distracted with talking with someone when all of a sudden it happened again. Except this time it was more forceful. Right. In the back of my mind, now that I'm thinking about it, the first time didn't draw a reaction. In fact, when he did it to me the first time, I stayed calm, cool, and collected and did not turn around, did not flinch, did not blink. I did nothing. And the second time, he was way more forceful to definitely make a statement that, hey, I'm, this is, I'm definitely touching you. But he walked by. He did what he did. And I knew exactly who it was. I knew, and I turned my head and saw this person and they made eye contact with me they looked over their shoulder and then I was like ooh I knew I, I knew it I got you you did this and there was no qualm about it in my mind and because we made eye contact now he knew that I knew and there was a problem and there was no turning back at this point because the cat's out of the bag so 
This is an abuser who is really good at it, and he knows. It's like he, he is methodical, and he decided at that point he was going to try to intimidate me. Right. Because I'd made eye contact, because he knew that I knew, we had some kind of a meeting in the fellowship hall after church, and him and his wife were sitting right behind where my husband and I normally sit. Yeah, because we, we went into the meeting, and they were already sitting there. I mean, we'd left our belongings in the sanctuary because we knew we were coming right back. Right. And he had wanted his wife to sit in our seats. She actually sat down in our seats, looked down and said, no, no, we can't sit here. Someone else's things are here. So they stood up and moved back a row. So then I came in and I still hadn't told my husband. I still hadn't told anyone and had to sit there in front of this man for over an hour. During that meeting. Yep. During the meeting. You know, I'm a tough gal. I've been through some stuff. <laughs> I mean, I've been, lived a lily white, perfect life. You know, I've seen some stuff. I've been to public school. <laughs> You've been a part of the public school system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been to, you know, really good public schools. Yeah. And um, he wasn't going to intimidate me. But, you know, my adrenaline's running, my heart's racing, and I'm a nervous wreck. And But I'm calm, cool, and collected because I'm not afraid of this guy. Anyway, so we tell the past. Well, I tell my husband. We end up telling the pastor. He ends up talking to the elders. And when we sat down to talk to the pastor about it, the minute I sat down with him and told him what happened, he knew right away who this person, who did it. Yeah. And I was he shocked. He knew who you were talking about. And I was shocked. I'm like, all of that perfect little Christian family thing was all a facade. Yeah. I mean, this guy had had issues for a very long time, and he had been being discipled and counseled by the elders and by the pastor for over a year and a half yeah and i was shocked first of all that he was allowed to serve in children's ministry in the first place well by this time the second incident happened he wasn't serving in the children's ministry any longer but i'm starting to think you know if he hadn't have been back there in the first place would i have been victimized at all right and how many other people in the church has this happened to? Right. Because my reaction the first time it happened, that has to be a common thing. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine most people would be like, oh, I'm sure it was just an accident. probably just bumped into me. But I was flabbergasted that this man had been given freedom to maneuver about the church and even serve in the church right. in the most vulnerable area of our church. Right. And and we're not going to go into the details, but this man had a rap sheet in our church. Yeah, we won't. And so the fact that he was allowed to serve in children's ministry is absolutely appalling. Mm -hmm. The person who was in charge of the children's ministry when the first incident occurred was also the same person that was discipling this man. Yeah. For over a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And this was an elder. Yeah. And I found out this information long after the fact because I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this elder and it came up in conversation. Oh, man. We started putting two and two together, you yep. know, and it appeared this guy was definitely getting preferential treatment. Yep. So you and I sat down with the pastor and he knew who you were talking about. He did. And decided they were going to take action and use church discipline. And remove him from the congregation. Because? What happened to me was the straw that broke the camel's back, but he clearly had a rap sheet already. He, w he had already been under church discipline up to that point. Oh, but nobody knew. But nobody knew. Mm -hmm. And so what he did to you yeah. was the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. That this man had an area of sin in his life that was controlling him. Mm -hmm. And now he's publicly, inappropriately touching women in yeah. the church. Mm -hmm. And so he was disciplined out of the congregation. He was. Yes. And he was told that he couldn't set foot on the premises. On the premises at all. 
Right. Right. When we were in talking with the pastor, he pretty much told me that I should really be careful about who I talk to about this. Mm-hmm. And that he would prefer that I keep it to myself. And and me as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was notified that there was going to be a meeting where they were going to announce to the membership that this man was going to be removed from the congregation. And that the reason they were going to give was because of his habitual sinful behavior that was unrepentant. And there was no mention of me. No mention of the incident. I was not given any voice. There was no opportunity for anyone else to come forward and say, yeah, that happened to me too. It was pretty much swept under the carpet, and I felt like good that what happened to me was the straw that broke the camel's back finally because they realized what a liability this guy is. But I was angry that they didn't give me any counseling they didn't give me any attention or any voice I was a non-issue I mean no one no one knows about what happened you were completely neglected by church leadership well, there you go that's the word yeah and I'm sitting there watching this be handled by that same elder by the way mm-hmm. same guy that discipled this man for over a year and a half mm-hmm knew about his habitual sin, Mm -hmm. allowed him to serve in children's ministry, Mm -hmm. is now up in front of the church membership Mm -hmm. telling them that this man is being dismissed for habitual sin, not telling them what the sin is. No, use your imagination. And not even (laughs) drawing any attention to the fact that you, my wife, were... Victimized. Victimized by this man. Yeah. Instead, the whole situation was spun to focus on this man's wife. And to feel sorry for And for everybody to feel bad for this man's wife. Which I do. Which certainly you do. (laughs) Don't, please, ladies and gentlemen, do not hear either one of us saying that this wife of his does not deserve any sympathy, support, counseling, whatever. But without going into any detail, it's not like it was any of a secret that she needed any of that in the first place. Yeah. This also brings up misogyny in my mind. But what makes me upset is that as the victim of something like this, you know, I'm wondering, what are these people thinking? Like, I'm some loose woman who was asking for it. Why would I need to have any sympathy or any counseling or any kind of compassion? Because I'm the one who drew this attention to myself somehow. You know, honey, I do remember the day that the day that we reported this to the pastor. I remember coming home and in the car. I remember you saying, "Am I wearing something provocative? Am I wearing something that attracted this attention?" You, you mentioned that it makes you think of misogyny, and that is what misogyny is. And for the record, she was not. No. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. My wife does not dress inappropriately. I probably volunteered the information. Like, I was wearing pants, and they weren't tight, and I was wearing a sweater up to my neck. Right? Yeah, but but that's the culture. Yeah. The culture is, well, obviously, you must have done something or said something or been dressed in a certain way that made it difficult for him to overcome the temptation of making an advance to you. Right, and what's really sad is... You know, part of me is thinking, if they had given me a voice, how many people would have thought, hmm, I wonder what that Andrea was doing? You know, was she flirting with him? Was she making eyes at him? What was she wearing? Mm. You know, and I didn't do anything. I mean, really? Right. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) no. Now, I, I mean, it's laughable to me because I know myself and I just know I wasn't doing anything. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. Yeah. Even if you were Potiphar's wife, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you my wife is not Potiphar's wife. <laughs> you know, that's good. That would make you Potiphar. <laughs> well, he was pretty rich and well-liked and got someone thrown in jail. So, you know, this is a perfect example of preferential treatment like we're talking about. And yet I kept thinking to myself, what is it about this guy that makes him such an asset? Right. 
I mean, why are they giving him so much attention? I mean, is it just because, you know, he's a, comes from a Christian family and he has these kids and they feel like, you know, they really want to work on this guy and help him be successful in life and in his marriage to his wife. And But, you know, after hearing about his rap sheet thinking to myself why is he still here yeah i kept i kept thinking the same thing like why in the world would somebody who is under this level of scrutiny right on a regular basis at church be kept around Mm -hmm. if he is in fact such a liability right what happened was my husband was in their presence when he walked off the premises for the last time and when he walked out the door the pastor looked at my husband and said there goes millions of dollars that literally was the first thing that came out of this man's mouth this pastor's mouth so this guy was an asset because of his money Mm -hmm. i mean million he was a multi-millionaire and Right. uh, right after they dismissed this man and there was a membership meeting the elder who was the one who was discipling this guy and who was um, leading the meeting, walked up to me, grabbed my hands and put them in his, looked me in the eye and said, I'm really sorry that this happened. If there's anything you need, let me know. Here's a little tip for our listeners, okay? If you are ever in the presence of someone who's been inappropriately touched or abused physically in any way, Never walk right up to them and touch them, ever. Never do it. I felt violated again. Right. I know that, that, I mean, no one has the permission to come up and just touch me. I'm not the huggiest person, trust me. I'm like, eh, okay, I'll give you a hug. Hey, it's nice to see you. I'm not a super huggy person. And for someone to just walk up to me and grab my hands after I was just inappropriately touched. Mm. Grossed me out. I was mad. I mean, doesn't this man have any common sense at all? Well, here's a pro tip. Yeah. No man, especially (laughs) an elder, ever has the right or the permission to touch another woman. Yeah. Ever. I mean, I'm telling you, that man is absolutely incredibly lucky and fortunate that he does not have broken legs. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. Because I'm sorry. I mean, I was kind of shocked and I was just like, oh man. And I I just, I went home thinking, I need a bubble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I just buy one of those inflatable balls <laughs> that you can stand in and roll around? I right. mean, I just want a, my own bubble here. We do not ever condone when you are spiritually abused to cut and run. No. Unless it's literally for life or death reasons. Like it, like first instance, you know, initial spiritual abuse. Right. Of course not. Yeah, you try to work it out. Right. Fortunately or unfortunately for our audience, there's going to be a second part of this story okay. in our next episode. All right. And I'm going to share my story. All right. Because it piggybacks on your story. Mm-hmm. They, they, tie, they go together. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the integrity of my wife mm-hmm. is saintly. <laughs> like, seriously. And when the conversation starts happening, honey, I think that we should consider looking for a new church. We had put up with so much crap. Yeah. Well, you know, I do have to admit that deep diving into partiality and preferential treatment after this happened, I really felt like I was seen as a liability. I don't know. um, I was definitely probably our whole family was seen as a liability. I mean, in retrospect, looking back. Um, because we had this secret, because it incriminated the people who were in charge. I mean, if everyone in the whole congregation knew, it would draw a bunch of questions. Right. The same questions that I raised, like, why is this guy serving? 
you've known about this for how long? You've invested so much time into this guy. Why? You as an elder board have permitted and perpetuated this behavior. Yeah, and I really feel like um, they went about trying to get rid of us because we were a liability and there was damage done and we were just kind of like, we were the mistake that they just wanted to sweep under the carpet Mm. instead of trying to help us heal help us be successful in our ministries at church that it would have just been easier for us to just leave or for them to drive us out yeah but either way for us to leave that's kind of the hard truth you know because after this incident things really got bad yeah for us at that church and it's been a while since all of this happened and we're still working out all of the healing process I mean it's a major loss yeah we have never told this story. No. We have kept this to ourselves. Yeah. And I mean, I want to be respectful, even though I don't agree with the leadership of the church and how they handled it. I don't agree with what how they handled his situation that led up to the incident. I don't agree with a lot of things, but I want to be respectful because ultimately they are our brothers and sisters in Christ and they've made mistakes. This is my wife's integrity. It's more important to my wife that she share her story for the purpose of helping others know that they are not alone. Right. And helping others begin their healing process Mm -hmm. as well. But I will tell you, Scripture is very clear about how the Lord takes justice on those who harm his children. Oh, wow. And Is that the millstone verse? Yes. Yes. It is better for a man to have a millstone tied around his neck and be cast into the sea than to cause one of my children to stumble. Wow. Now, I'm not trying to, like, you know, put a hex on people. (laughs) (laughs) But when I look at the qualifications of an elder, right? this man is horribly disqualified. They all are. Yeah. Because they allowed the harm of my wife. And they are unapologetic for that. They would have much rather that we kept the situation far, far away from the church. They were very, very strenuous in insisting that we file a police report against this man. They were very, very, very insistent that we have a gentleman's agreement, that we would never disclose this information to the congregation. Yeah. (laughs) And, And I'm telling you, we didn't sign anything. No, we didn't. And so... Shock. Shock. (laughs) But we basically were gagged. Yeah. And when that stuff is happening behind closed doors, take heed. That is dangerous. Right. When you are being abused in your church, wherever your abuse falls on the spectrum of spiritual abuse, it doesn't matter what it is. When you are in a church dynamic where you are being spiritually abused and you choose to handle it biblically and everywhere you turn, everywhere you go, you are met with rebuttal, denial, and neglect. Eventually, there comes a point when the only option is to finally leave. Yeah. It's not the first option, but eventually there may come a time where the only option is to leave Mm -hmm. when Jesus literally needs to become all that you need have you ever thought about if you lost everything like literally everything would Jesus be enough Mm -hmm. and in this type of a situation when it is perpetuated prolonged and permitted and you're getting nowhere with healing Mm -hmm. there comes a point where you realize Jesus has to be enough yeah. He has to be enough. Because the healing won't happen at your church at that point. Mm-hmm. Your church is now the cesspool of toxicity in your life. Yeah. What's so wonderful, though, is that Jesus said, Come to me, mm-hmm. all of you who are weary with heavy burdens, yeah. and I will give you rest. And, and, and sweetheart, I know that eventually we had to do that. Yeah, we did. It it was a tough choice because I'll I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I think that we stuck it out for at least another two and a half years. Yeah. You know what's so sad is that the one or two people that I actually considered friends aren't even really my friends. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. because of politics. Because of politics. She wouldn't have anything politics to do with me. Politics in the me. church. Yeah. Yeah. She wouldn't have anything to do with me after we left. Yeah. And then the other gal who I was friends with actually deleted and blocked me yeah. on social media when she found out we were leaving. And what's striking to me is this is probably one of the people who actually knew what happened to me in my abuse situation. Yeah. Because she was the pastor's wife. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Shocking. Why would she do that? Absolutely shocking. Well, honey, I really appreciate you sharing your story. You're welcome. I know that it's not easy. I certainly know that it's not fun. No. But you know that it's necessary. It is. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with pulling back from the people and the environment of your perpetuated abuse. And there's nothing wrong with choosing to only be with Jesus so that you can heal. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. And that is all I have to say about that. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Churchosity podcast, the show about the quality of being the church. Thank you once again to my amazing wife, especially for sharing your story with the audience this time. You're welcome. Be sure that every single one of you follows me on all of the socials, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Churchosity Pod. Drop us a message. Tell us your story, especially tell a friend to tell a friend what we're doing here and let them be part of the conversation as well. But always remember, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Thank you once again for joining. Thank you once again for listening. And until next time, this is The Theological Coordinator saying, peace.